began to meet regularly and study God's Word together, discuss um, hard questions. And then uh, one day, they just said, Pastor Darren, what are people going to think of me when I start to show? And he said, well, have you thought about just telling the congregation? Obviously, Edgar and Janine shut that down. They're not about to expose themselves to the church. No way. After week. Until one meeting, they sit down in front of Pastor Darren, and Edgar speaks up first before anyone can say a word and says, Pastor Darren, we made two decisions. One, we're getting married. Two, we're going to tell the congregation about the baby. And he was floored, but he was excited. Though there was nervousness about church members' responses to Janine and Edgar, um, he knew that there were many in the congregation who just loved these two young people. And so the day comes, and they go up before their church, and they share. As Darren has his arm around them, they share that there's a baby on the way, and there's a marriage around the corner. You know what follows that? That worship service. In the coming weeks, there's a surprise baby shower. And after that, there's a surprise wedding shower. And all, all through this process, the church is just pouring their, their heart into these two young people to get them into a, a place where they can raise a strong family. They, uh, they looked beyond the external and saw the hearts of these kids that really, they just needed some help. They just wanted a hand up. And the pastor made a, 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 a comment about this. He said, no one wondered if supporting the couple would encourage other girls to get pregnant. People were just filled with gratitude to be part of such a community of grace. There um, is a, a balance between living the right path with Christ and, and when someone is, has deviated that, being gracious to them, but at the same time not sweeping their struggle under the rug. And I think this church um, in this story embodied what Christ's message is all about. It's about restoration. The gospel changes our response to people's sin struggles when it tells us there is something to be restored to and there is a way to do it. No one is stuck right where they're at. There's always a hope. Now, there is a, um, a passage in Galatians I'd like you to turn to. Galatians 6.1. Galatians 6, verse 1. <clears throat> As you turn there, I'm going to give you a little context here. So, there is a lot of pagans who had been converted to follow Jesus. Pagans, as in they, they um, were under the same persuasion as the rest of the culture, that there were um, natural forces that ruled the world and a supernatural realm that controlled life. That was just mysterious and mystic. And um, when they heard the story about Jesus and the cross, they turned their focus and their faith to him, this Savior. And they clung to Paul's gospel, that we are rescued from our sins because of what Jesus had done at the cross, his substituting for us. But then there were Jews from Jerusalem who had pretended to be Christians and began teaching them a different gospel. They began teaching them something that people called the Judaizers would teach, that you needed to follow a certain, uh, a certain set of regulations, and that would be a sign that you are part of that covenant, of that, that promise that God has given, that you can take part in that. And specifically, they were saying, before you become saved Christians, first, you got to become Jews. From their perspective, there was only salvation, only favor of God within that community, whether it's by birth or by following these regulations and these rules. And they 
stressed and confused and pressured, these new Christians, and they fell back from the gospel that Paul had preached to them, that the good news was not in what good they were doing, but that it was in what good Christ had done for them. They, they were convinced the opposite, that unless they did these regulations, they were out. And in this context, Paul in this book is saying, you are saved not by obeying the law that does not cover for all the disobedience you have done. You are saved by grace alone in Christ Jesus. That there's only salvation in a Savior that is giving grace where sin abounds. And that is the common point that he's trying to make. And I bring us to 6 verse 1 because I think it's interesting that it's at the end of the chapter, after he's reminded them about the gospel, that he now gives them a charge. He gives them an appeal of how to apply it. Let's read it. I have the NIV um, here. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. You who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Now, the first thing I want to direct your attention to is this, those who live by the Spirit. There is a preparation that we must have before we start to address and help someone in a, live a healthier way. We must be filled with the Spirit. We must be having the mind of Christ that we are there to restore. We're not there to assert authority or to counsel as punishment. We are there to restore and get someone on track, which doesn't always sound gentle as we think. It's not necessarily in your tone. It's not necessarily that you kind of dance around the issue and not be direct with them. It's that in our hearts, we're not trying to fit them into a Christian mold or, su- or such. We're not, our, our goal is not to get their lives in what is acceptable in our culture as a church. We're not trying to fit them into something. We are simply trying to restore them to the relationship with Christ that he had always made them for. And in that, they find freedom. Now, I want to now turn your eyes to verse 13 of chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 13. 